Hello, I'm Norman Wobber. Today we are going to talk about mathematics education and a very important aspect of that is trigonometry. And with rational trigonometry we have on the horizon the possibility of a dramatically new and better way of restructuring mathematics education. So this has very, very big consequences, potential for millions of students. So mathematics educators really need to address some important new developments. So let's talk today about trigonometry from the point of view of mathematics education. Now we all know that there's hardly any more hated mathematics subject amongst students than trigonometry. It's universally regarded with fear, loathing, indifference, distaste. And unfortunately, it's not just the student's fault. It's a reflection, really, of the fact that this, this beautiful topic, and historically very important, is not really presented in the optimal way. That we should be able to find some more powerful, intriguing way of capturing our students' imagination when it comes to this really fabulous uh, topic. And one of the difficulties with it is that if you are teaching trigonometry, there are so many different aspects of it, and the logical relations between those different aspects is not at all always so clear. All right, so trigonometry involves all kinds of things, going back to Pythagoras' theorem, involving angles and lengths, angles perhaps measured in radians or in degrees. We have a lot of trig identities. We have cosines and sines and tans and cotans and cosecants and secants. There's some mysterious connection with the circle, very important. Then there's harmonic motion, which is somehow intimately connected with trigonometry. The Sokotoa laws that allow us to figure out how to understand the various relations in a right triangle and connecting that with this notion of angle. And then these laws, cosine law, sine law, and many other laws, along with double angle formulas and lots of other things. And then later on, Euler's formula, arctan, the inverse circular functions, yet more and more piled up on top of each other, and really not at all so clear what is the logical structure, what comes first here. In fact, we'll see that a critical part of the problem is that what is often presented as being sort of primary and sort of fundamental turns out to be actually full of subtlety and is only more properly established once you get to uh, calculus and more advanced mathematics. So it's very challenging to avoid sort of circularity in the setting up of this subject. So we want to talk a little bit about these things today with a big view of trying to think of alternate ways of structuring mathematics education ultimately, providing students with alternative ways of learning trigonometry. So as a subject in high school, trigonometry usually starts around year 10, although there will be some things that are done in year 9 and earlier that are sort of preparation for it. And then it sort of carries on year 10, year 11, year 12. So basically high school students get three years of trigonometric topics. That's a lot of time, a lot of energy devoted to this particular branch of uh, mathematics. But still students end up leaving with a confused orientation. They often resort to memorizing stuff. It's a bit of a black box to a lot of students. Well, why is that? Well, one of the reasons is that the subject is inherently logically complicated. It is a topic full of, full of subtlety and, in fact, difficulty, especially when you want to set it up correctly. And it's not really possible to set it up correctly in the high school context. So teachers are forced to present a somewhat distorted view of what the subject's really about, to keep certain issues hidden from students, and to try to make it look like it's relatively easy. Well, actually, it's not so easy at all. Another aspect of it is that a lot of the topics in this area have a dual aspect. There's often two different ways of approaching or even defining objects. 
And often it's not clear which one is the primary one and which is the secondary one. So students are often not entirely clear. Should we look at things this way in this particular situation or should we look at things from this point of view? How do you tell which is the right definition to be using at any given time? And again, that's a reflection of the lack of a kind of linear or tree-like logical structure. We don't have this very clear enunciation of the logical structure, and so naturally students are caught up often in sort of circular reasons. So this kind of uh, setup is really perfect for confusing good students because good students want to know, you know why things are the way they are. On the other hand, it's also good for promoting rote learning amongst weaker students because the weaker students think, well, okay, the only way of getting through this is by memorizing what you have to do. In such a situation, you do this, and in such a situation, you do that. So this is not a very attractive uh, orientation for mathematics, of course. And so we have a lot of work to do, really, in terms of fixing our approach to trigonometry, even at the high school level. But it doesn't end at the high school level, unfortunately. It also impacts very strongly with university and college education, too, as we'll discuss. So let's have a view of this multifaceted aspect of trigonometry. And a good place to start is with your basic right triangle, which is sort of at the heart of the subject. All right, so here's a triangle, and it has side lengths A, B, and C. And we have some control over those things because of the all-important relation usually called Pythagoras' theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. That's a fundamental relation between these three sides, okay. But now in addition to that, one is often interested in ratios formed by these sides, especially when we're thinking about this shape of the triangle as being important. So what happens if we scale this triangle up or down, then the ratios of the sides are going to be preserved. And those ratios end up having names in terms of vertices or perhaps angles. So if we're looking at things from this point of view, from the point A, then the ratio, say, B to C, it's called adjacent over hypotenuse, then that ends up being called the cosine of the angle here at this vertex. It's called the angle theta. And again, from this point of view, the ratio A to C, opposite, over hypotenuse, that's the sine of this angle, and then the ratio A over B is the tan of this angle. Okay, so those are kind of your basic circular or trigonometric functions, and they're defined and understood in terms of the context of a right triangle, and the geometry of a right triangle, notably involving the three side lengths and the three angles. Okay, uh, then there's sort of associated inverse uh, functions or relations that allow you to express the angle in terms of the various ratios. Okay, so these are sort of coming from these primary things. So this is kind of one view. This is sort of the traditional triangle point of view towards trigonometry. But now, at some point, the student makes this transition to thinking about things in terms of circles. And there, a picture like this becomes important, where the triangle becomes of secondary importance and the circle becomes of primary importance. In particular, this unit circle with a radius of 1. x squared plus y squared equals 1. Now, from this point of view, what we're interested in in trigonometry is the relationship between a point on this circle and its x and y coordinates. Okay, so here's a point on the circle, and that point can be described in a number of ways. It can be described in terms of the x-coordinate and the y-coordinate, but also in terms of the angle that is made by typically the positive x-axis, that angle theta. Now, in terms of the geometry here, the meaning of this angle is as an arc length. Okay, so the actual length of this circular arc is the definition of theta from this circular point of view. That's actually 
subtly but importantly different from the original understanding of an angle here in terms of Babylonian system of degrees where we measure things in terms of degrees using a protractor. Okay, so this is a, a part of the duality of whether we think about cosines and sines now as representing the x and y coordinates of a point on the circle or in terms of ratios of uh, sides of a right triangle. Then there's another sort of interpretation that's often important, which is that of the context of bearing. When you have four points of a compass, here's north, east, west, and south, and the bearing then is the angle that a particular direction, say that direction there, makes with the north direction, where we're now moving in a clockwise direction. So the angle now is measured from the true north and measured clockwise in that direction there. So this would be the angle here, which is notably different from the situation here where the reference point is sort of due east along the x direction in the positive direction and where the angle is being measured counterclockwise, what's called the positive direction here. So students end up having to navigate from one system to another where things are changing, the meanings of terms are changing, the meanings of the conventions are changing. Here the angle is not oriented. We're not talking about an angle from here to here or an angle from here to here. We're just talking about the angle. Here the angle gets interpreted differently subtly with a, an orientation. Here also there's an orientation but it's the opposite orientation and starting from a different spot. So you can see that there's a there's a manifold aspect here which adds to the natural difficulty of the subject already in the first place. But that's not all the problem, right? There's a lot more subtlety involved. So perhaps only later on when students get to university level courses and perhaps even second or third year courses, do they start to appreciate that actually the underpinnings of this subject are actually quite subtle and that Really, to get a proper theory of angles and, and, and circular arcs and associated uh, sort of circular functions, you need a prior theory of real numbers. Okay, that's a, kind of an implicit requirement. That's really the numerical uh, setup which you officially need in order to be able to do things officially correctly. That is, if you believe the standard story, which of course I don't. But along with a prior theory of real numbers, implicitly also really a theory of calculus is required. But of course that's kept hidden from high school students because they haven't learned calculus. So, for example, this has manifest itself uh, directly in terms of this crucial quantity pi, which ends up figuring very prominently. So when you're discussing circular things, then this pi gets involved. And what is pi? Well, one definition is that pi is the area of a unit radius circle. So here's a circle with radius 1. It supposedly has an area. Okay, so if you believe that, then you can say, well, let's call this area pi. Let's denote that area by this Greek letter. Another approach is to say that it's actually related to the length of the circumference of this same circle. Okay, so the circumference is supposed to be 2 pi. So you could define pi to mean the circumference of this unit circle divided by 2. So there's a, sort of a fork in the road here. You can try to define pi in terms of an area, or you can try to define pi in terms of a length of a circular arc. In either case, you're really dealing with calculus notions. So both area and lengths of circular curves, or in fact any kind of curves, are calculus notions and they're full of subtlety and in fact difficulty. Okay, so this is um, an underpinning, a crucial underpinning which is not really there when students start learning about trigonometry. Of course at first they avoid things by dealing with a, a protractor. I don't know if you can see this, probably the focus is not good, but of course you're all familiar with the protractor. There's a protractor. So you line this thing up, you line it up, and then you measure 0, 10, 20, 30. So if you have an angle from here to here, you look it up and you read something, a number on this thing here. And so this 
degree-based protractor is sort of the foundation for angles for high school students when they're beginning their their learning of trigonometry and then eventually they switch to this circular point of view where the angles in degrees get replaced by angles measured in radians it's really coming from this circular arc point of view where you're measuring arcs of circles it's a very subtle distinction and without a proper foundation in calculus it really doesn't work logically okay but nevertheless these are difficulties that are sort of floating around at the bottom of trigonometry that high school teachers somehow have to navigate their way through. So really at the core of a lot of difficulties with trigonometry is this ambiguity with the actual fundamental notion of an angle. Something that actually Euclid struggled over as well. And I think this is really brought out by a, an explicit challenge like this. Okay, which is a favorite challenge of mine. So here is a rectangle, very simple kind of rectangle, side one and side two. Okay, and okay, that rectangle has a diagonal, which you can see there, and so there's an angle formed between the base and this diagonal. And the question is, what is this angle exactly? Okay, very interesting question. So a student will say, okay, well, here's a protractor. I'm just going to put this protractor on here. Da -da -da. There we go, line that one up there, then read up here, and okay, it looks like it's, well, I should get over there. No, it looks like it's maybe a little bit less than 30 degrees. Okay, so you could approximate it using a protractor. But how do you actually calculate it exactly? Well, that's a very naughty problem. And you can sort of see that if you can't actually calculate an angle, even in a simple example like this, exactly accurately, then all kinds of computations can only really be done approximately. And this difficulty, very explicit difficulty, manifests itself in undergraduate education just as much as high school education. Because what ends up happening is that whenever we want to ask students about explicit examples for which they can make calculations, we resort to these two basic triangles. The 1-1-root-2 one, one, triangle, with angles of pi by 4 and pi by 4 in the radian system, or the 1, 2, root 3 triangle with angles of pi on 3 and pi on 6 in the radian system. These are basically the only two triangles that high school students and also undergraduates are comfortable dealing with in terms of knowing what the relations are without calculators or trig tables. Okay, so they are taught to memorize these things so that they can read off that the cosine of pi by 3 is 1 half. The sine of pi by 3 is root 3 on 2. The cosine of pi on 6 is root 3 on 2. The sine of pi on 6 is 1 over 2. So they can easily recite these values and so you can get them to make calculations with figures that involve these triangles. So even at the undergraduate level, when math educators like myself cook up problems for tests, exams, assignments, these triangles figure prominently. They're used over and over and over and over and over and over again. It's very limiting, and it's because a general angle is such a problematic thing to get your head around and to actually calculate exactly. Approximately, yes, you just stick your protractor on there. Um, a little bit more sophisticated with some table or these days a calculator or computer, you can get your calculator to spit out some decimal values for the, for the angle. But in terms of actually having a really correct value, that always sort of eludes us. So the entire subject becomes an approximate subject, one that we can't actually access completely correct answers to. And students just get used to this. This is just the way trigonometry is. It's, it's not an exact science, it's an approximate science. We're always relying on decimal approximations to answers, just the way things are. Okay, and let's also mention the other circular functions. So here's our basic right triangle again, and along with cosine, sine, and tan, we also have these other ones, secant of theta, which is C over B, that's the reciprocal of cosine. 
cosecant of theta, which is C over A, that's the reciprocal of sine, and cotan theta, which is B over A, which is the reciprocal of tan theta. Now that's sort of from the point of view of the right triangle and relations with the right triangle. At the level of circles, these things also figure, but the geometry is maybe a little bit more sophisticated. So here is our unit circle again, there's an angle of theta with the x-axis, there's our point on the unit circle, and here is the value cosine theta, and here's the value sine theta, the x and the y coordinates of this point. So geometrically they correspond to uh, these quantities here on the diagram. And then it's pleasant to uh, convince yourself that the other kinds of quantities can also be sort of seen on the diagram. In fact, they can be seen in a number of different ways, so this is only one way. But uh, one way is to think of this segment here as representing the tan of theta, and here is cotan of theta. And secant theta turns out to be this quantity here. Cosecant's a little bit more uh, complicated. I'll leave it to you as an exercise to see if you can find cosecant uh, somewhere there. You may have to draw some additional lines. Okay, so you have a, a manifold number of, of these trigonometric functions or circular functions, and then there's all kinds of relations between them, and uh, a lot of complexity algebraically and just sort of bookkeeping-wise, you know, keeping all of these things uh, together. And at the same time, keeping the triangular point of view and the circular point of view sort of adjacent but separate in your mind. Okay, we're really combining the theory of a triangle here with the theory of a circle and saying, oh, these are all the same thing. I don't agree with that point of view. Right? To me, those are quite separate topics. The theory of the triangle is over here, the theory of a circle is over here. They don't necessarily need to be taught at the same time. Okay, that's my orientation. That's the orientation that you get with rational trigonometry. You end up having a quite different point of view to all these things. Okay, it's a dramatically different orientation to the whole subject. So this discussion, interesting though it is, avoids two key problems. There are these two key hidden problems that are sort of underlying modern trigonometry that students are not even really aware of. And one of them is, how do you actually make a protractor? Okay, so here's a protractor. Someone has gone through the trouble of dividing the circle into 360 different equal little pieces allowing you a scale, essentially a linear kind of scale, imposed on this circular object. And how do you actually go about doing that? So, suppose that we didn't have one of these things, and we just had a circle like this, and it was up to me to go from 0 to 90. Okay, I've got a pen here, you're not going to be able to see it. But suppose I had to, for the sake of argument, subdivide this thing into 90 equal little pieces. I had to make actually a physical protractor. Suppose you had to do that. That is a very, very challenging thing to do, precisely. Okay. Probably what you're going to do is use some kind of Greek uh, geometry. So you're going to get yourself a compass. Okay, that would be a helpful tool. And with a compass, you can bisect segments or angles. So we could bisect this thing and, and sort of get 45 degrees. And then we could bisect that and get 45 degrees divided by 2, that's 22 and a half degrees. So we could keep on bisecting, that would be probably a good first approximation. But dividing by 2 is not the same as dividing by 90, right? We want to divide this into 90. So that would require some much more subtle um, thinking. And in fact, that's highly challenging to do. And that's hidden from students because they've been given protractors. They don't appreciate how difficult that is. Maybe they think that because you can duplicate an angle, like let's say you have a given angle, that's not very good. Let's say we consider a particular angle like this and we want to duplicate that angle. That's not so hard to do with a compass. You get your compass here and you, or maybe here, and you make a circle and then you're able to find a, a duplicate value. So you're able to duplicate angles. That's fair enough, but that's different from dividing an angle equally, as this great um, 
famous problem of uh, trisecting an angle that goes back to the Greek shows. So this is a very subtle problem. And an even more subtle and even more important problem is how do you actually make a trig table? So a trig table is where you actually see the values for different angles, once you've got all these angles, say 1 degree, 2 degree, 3 degree, 4 degree, down to 9 degrees, what are their various cosines, sines, and tans? Perhaps the other ones as well. This is actually the heart of trigonometry. Okay? All those other things are somehow incidental or secondary. The, really the heart of trigonometry is a table like this that actually gives you specific values of these things in classical trigonometry. Okay? So it's impossible to overemphasize the importance of this kind of thing historically. Allowing you, for example, to answer the question, let's say that's 37 degrees, so we have an angle of 37 degrees there, then what actually is this cosine of 37, this x displacement here? What is sine of 37 degrees, that y displacement there? Well, you just look up on your table and you see the values. But how do you come up with such a table? This question is almost completely hidden to a modern students, and thereby they, they don't really appreciate the, the logical core of the entire subject. Right? The, for millennia, literally millennia, people have been struggling to get better and better technologies for creating such tables. And these days, unfortunately, to a certain extent, it's all hidden by the power of the, the calculators that they have on their desks. But that means that logically there's a disconnect from the, the essential core of this problem. And to uh, really um, explore this, uh, I think, is an interesting thing, and I want to do that in my next video. So I want to talk about um, a very interesting fellow called Reticus, who was a contemporary of Copernicus, who actually was responsible for the, the greatest trigonometric tables around the 17th century. And so I'm going to talk about his development of trigonometric tables with a view of clarifying the importance and the central aspect of this particular problem. And uh, then we're going to come back to mass education and rational trigonometry and try to map out a future direction for the education of young people in trigonometry. So very important and exciting stuff. Next time, Reticus and 17th century trig tables. Hope you'll join me for that. I'm Norman Wahlberger. Thanks for listening.